Hi, today we have Dr. Melissa Jenkins, an assistant professor at the University of Mary Washington in Fredericksburg, Virginia, to talk to us a bit about her research experiences. Dr. Jenkins helped with our mixed methods chapter, and she has a wealth of experiences that have contributed to her research. She served as a special educator for 11 years and has taught students with exceptionalities in each of the IDEA categories. And she really helps to connect with readers and students to influence her research. She also has experiences serving as a behavioral specialist, central office administrator, and instructional coach. So without further delay, uh, Dr. Jenkins, can you talk a bit about how you first became interested in research? Absolutely. So my first foray into research was really as a consumer of research. When I was a practicing special educator, I would often work with students who had not been successful with previous programs or interventions, and I relied on the research, on published, published research, to identify strategies and supports that would work for those children. So there were many, many hours spent exploring education databases, trying to match student needs and student characteristics with practices that had been identified through published research. And then I would take that information, those strategies, back to my classroom and implement them and collect data to see if they were effective for my students. So really in those early years, I was conducting action research and I didn't even really know it, um, but I was really heavily focused on using existing research to meet the needs of my students. Wow, so you began re using research as a classroom teacher. Can you talk a bit how you transitioned into more formal research roles um, and clearly making that, that decision to become a researcher? Absolutely. So as a practitioner, I had so many questions about how to better serve student needs. And I distinctly remember a moment in my career, in my learning career and my professional career, where I recognized that I had the skills to ask the questions that were relevant and develop research programs and conduct that research to answer those questions. And that occurred, I would say about a year before my dissertation research. I was conducting a pilot study on mathematics intervention and it was a really small group of students. It wasn't anything that could you know, really be worthy of publishing, but it allowed me to have that experience and to see that I could do the work ultimately that answered questions that were important to me, that were important to my fellow teachers. So that was that kind of aha moment of, oh, I know how to do this. I can make um, progress in addressing the questions that are important to me. Now, for everyone who is involved in master's level work or doctoral level work, you know, there's usually a request to reflect on those types of activities. <laughs> and that was definitely the case as I was doing this pilot project. And I remember having this moment of reflecting on that pilot project and realizing that I had made this transition from just being the consumer of research, from always reading it when it was done by other people, to now being able to do it, to produce it, and to share it. And so many of my colleagues were interested in the work that I was doing. I kind of lit the fire in me that the research questions that I had and the way that I would pursue exploring them was relevant and interesting to teachers. Well, it sounds like you made an amazing shift from uh, classroom consumer of research to beginning to collect data independently. Now that you have that wealth of knowledge and skill, how do you choose topics? There are so many needs in education. There are. There are so many needs. I think we will never run out of potential topics. I am very practitioner focused. For me, it's all about finding what will work for teachers and students. So my background as a classroom teacher myself my work as a coach, as an administrator, the work that I do now supervising student teachers in multiple placements, 
that is where I get the information that lets me know that there is a concern. I hear teachers and parents sometimes and students saying, we have this area of concern, we don't quite know how to address it. And those become the topics that I end up focusing on. So I'm always very connected to that pragmatic element. What is the need in real classrooms? And then how can we address it in a way that can then take it back into a classroom? So an example is really um, evident right now as we are dealing with these emergency school closures related to COVID-19. And our special education stakeholders have been so clear that there are a lot of concerns about how we can meet the needs of students with disabilities right now. And we're also hearing some suggestion that some kids are benefiting from this remote learning. So that became an obvious topic of research for me. Right now, I am just a week or so into launching a, a survey research project. And the questions that we used when we developed this survey were based on the concerns that we were hearing from stakeholders, the information I was hearing from teachers and parents of students that I had worked with in the past. And so we put together this survey. We sent it out to pilot with um, representatives of all kinds of stakeholder groups to see if these were the questions that they were concerned about. And we got their feedback. Um, to kind of shape that survey a little more to again be more relevant and more focused on the issues that they had concerns about. So now that's out there in the world, we uh, are very certain that it's a, a topic of interest because we have had a, a high number of responses in a very short time, which was a pleasant surprise given that we had to use snowball sampling um, during these COVID closures and we were uncertain about what would happen when we put it out there but um, the response has been quick <laughs> and I'm really eager to find out what all of these stakeholders are telling us. Well I'm eager to read it <laughs> when you disseminate. Um, it, it sounds like you've got a lot of work that you're engaged in um, and other researchers are engaged in, in work as well. Do you think we as a research community will ever reach a point when we finally conducted enough research to provide significant guidance to educators? If so, how will we know when we have it? Yeah, that's a really important question and a really complex question at the same time. I think there are areas of intervention research where we have a very large body of information about what works well for students. I would say reading intervention is an example where we know that there has been research conducted um, that identifies effective strategies across the big five areas of reading. It's been conducted with all kinds of populations of students addressing various needs and in various settings. So if there is a body of research that is sufficient, it might be that area. We also know that there are areas of intervention research that are delayed, that are lagging, and mathematics intervention is one of those areas, um, probably related to the fact that it began well after reading intervention research, um, and probably also related to the fact that the scope and the breadth of mathematics instruction and intervention is so broad when we look at the differences of what we expect from a kindergartner or a preschooler to what we expect from a high schooler. The need for interventions, of, of course, will vary significantly. And then you add the layers of student population and student characteristics and settings, and that adds to the complexity of the research. So that's an area where we know that the research isn't sufficient yet. Now when we try to answer the question, are we ever going to get to this sufficiently effective body of research, the problem that we are running into now is that research to practice gap. If we don't get the research into the hands of teachers so that they can use it and implement it and tell us if it's meeting the needs of all of their students, we aren't truly going to know that it is a sufficient amount of research. So if we're going to address that, we as researchers need to be thoughtful about where we're publishing our research and how we're publishing it so that 
practicing teachers can access it. We know that a lot of practicing teachers aren't reading pure research journals. They might have access to practitioner journals, but even that I would say is probably relatively low just from my personal interactions with teachers. So we need to be thoughtful about getting that information to them in a way that is accessible. And we also probably need to consider ways that we can make connections that are more hands-on, make the research findings more accessible and more practi practical to practicing teachers. So that's my thought on how we might close the research gap. <laughs> One tiny step in that direction. Um, but until we do that, I just don't think we can ever say we have sufficient information because we don't know if it's working for students yet. Well, that was a complex question and a great answer. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for contributing. To that. This has been so, so helpful and um, I'm a fan. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>